Good morning. Today we're going to discuss Hooke's Law and see how it applies to several different types of objects. In addition, we'll be discussing the spring constant, K. So Hooke's Law. For relatively small compressions or extensions of an object or material, the amount of extension compression is directly proportional to the applied force acting on the object or the material. So today we're going to discuss Hooke's Law by using a spring as an example. Before we discuss Hooke's Law, some terms we need to know. Equilibrium. This is the length of the spring when there are no forces acting on it. So we say that the spring is in its equilibrium state or equilibrium position. Extension. This is when we increase the length of the spring. As we can see, the applied force is to the right, and the spring force acting is to the left. And finally, compression. This is when the length of the spring decreases. This time the applied force is to the left, and the spring force acts towards the equilibrium position, towards the right. And so let's see what happens when we remove the applied force. Notice the spring returns to its equilibrium position. Similarly, when there's a compression involved and we remove the applied force, once again the spring returns to its equilibrium position. Notice, as we increase the length of the spring, as we extend it, the force increases. For this particular spring, to extend it by a distance of 0.25 meters requires 5 newtons of force. Notice at equilibrium, of course, there is no force acting on the spring. Now if we compress the spring, similarly, the greater the distance that the compression is, the greater the force that is required. Let's see what the relationship is. So we'll begin with our initial data point which states that for an extension of zero meters, the force is zero newtons. Now let's extend this and plot that data point. Let's continue to extend it. And we'll make it a little more extended. Notice there was a linear trend in the data. We say that objects or materials that behave in this manner obey Hooke's Law. As we can see from this graph, we can write the statement force equals some constant, which we'll call k, times x. k is called the spring constant. To determine the spring constant, we need to calculate the slope of this line. In other words, we need to calculate the rise and the run. The unit of the rise is the newton, the unit of the run is meter, and so the unit for the slope of this line, which is the spring constant, is newton per meter. x represents the extension. The unit for extension is meter. So we have this linear graph. However, Every material, every object has a limit. This limit is called the elastic limit, where the graph no longer behaves in a linear fashion. For that particular part of the graph that I've highlighted, if the force or the extension exceeds the elastic limit, if it goes beyond that point, then notice the force is no longer proportional to the extension, and as a result, 
the object or the material will no longer return to its original state, to its equilibrium state, or to its equilibrium length. When this happens, we often use the term permanent deformation. For this part of the graph, when the force or the extension is below the elastic limit, then when the applied force is removed, if it's a spring, it will return to its equilibrium length. So how is spring constant K actually measured? Well, imagine we have the spring. Initially, the spring is in its equilibrium position. And then we add some weights. After adding the weights, we measure the extension. Notice the spring has gotten longer. It's extended. Now, by knowing the number of weights we've added, we can calculate the force of gravity, mg. This is identical to the spring force. And by using the equation force equals spring constant times x, x being the extension. And once again, knowing that the force is equivalent to the weight, acting on the weights, mg, we could rearrange that equation and solve for the spring constant by dividing by the extension. So do all springs have the same spring constant? Well, the answer is no. For this first spring, only 5 newtons of force is required to extend the spring by 0.25 meters. For the next spring, notice a greater amount of force is required, 7.5 newtons. And finally, for the spring with the smallest diameter, the greatest amount of force is required, 15 newtons. If we were to graph these results, it would look something like this. Here is the first spring. Notice the slope here on the graph is the least. Here's our next spring. As I move the spring back and forth, you can see the data point moving on the graph. And finally, here's the last spring. And notice the data point moving along the graph as I move the spring back and forth. This spring has the greatest spring constant. So besides springs, there are other objects that can be modeled by using Hooke's law. A bow, for example. The extension of the string of the bow is directly proportional to the applied force. What does that mean? Well, for a typical bow that has a spring constant that is 300 newtons per meter, it means the following. If we were to extend the string back, if we were to pull the string back by a length of 1 meter, it would require 300 newtons of force exactly. In addition, a hockey stick also behaves in this manner, where the amount the stick bends or flexes, as you can see in the diagram, is directly proportional to the applied force. In fact, when hockey sticks are sold, a person buys a stick based on a rating called the flex rating. For this particular stick, it's flex 85. This means that the stick will flex one inch or will bend by one inch for every 85 pounds of force that is applied to the stick. So I hope you've enjoyed today's activity. Have a great day. Bye-bye.